but uh, through statistical analysis, oxygen only are significantly different. So also see that the preventative treatment, e.g., followed by elastase, fall, falls between both from the untreated as well as from the elastase. However, the restorative treatment is not as, uh, is not as effective. You can see the green. Our blue here is very similar in shape. Our compliance versus pressure curve was calculated as so we can see similar results. The prevention classes followed by EQCG and the last initial crop in compliance, whereas the Followed by elastase is able to maintain compliance, different changes in physiological significant pressures, which is 90 to 120 millimeters of mercury. Um, then, if we look at our stress strain curve, so stress strain is calculated using our unloaded dimensions. It allows us to normalize for any geometrical differences. So the compliance doesn't account for that, but the stress strain does. We don't have an untreated curve for this because we don't have unloaded measurements for untreated vessels since each vessel is treated, so we don't have anything for that. However, we can extrapolate that since EGCG and only and untreated are fairly similar in behavior that that is, um, we can make that comparison. So we can see that EGCG only has a relatively linear behavior, whereas everything else that has been treated with elastase has a more non-linear behavior. However, the preventative, once again, is more similar to the EGCG only, whereas the restorative is more similar to the elastase only. And th these results are also fairly consistent in our imaging. So the imaging here, the green is the um, elastin autofluorescence. It shows the elastin laminate nicely. And then the collagen is imaged through se second harmonic generation, SHG. Yeah. Um, and that allows us to visualize the um, collagen. So we can see in all of the EGCG treated groups, there is there are these adhesions in the lamina, which are pointed out by the arrows here. However, and then in the elastase treated groups, you can see it's not as clear in the um, preventative and restorative. However, in elastase only, there's a very clear buckling in the um, elastase and in, in elastin fibers, which follows as it does not function as normally. And so overall, all of our results show that the EGCG plus elastase results are more similar to the untreated vessel, whereas the restorative um, treatment is more similar to the elastase only. So our final conclusions are that EGCG can be useful as a preventative measure in preventing mechanical changes in TAAs. And this is hopeful as it can maybe used as a pharmaceutical treatment. So future work we're looking at is we're going to continue doing some mechanical data analysis and constitutive modeling. We're also exploring a polyphenol stain to hopefully see if we can get a visual idea of where the EGCG is going in the vessel wall and where it kind of like deposits. Um, we're currently struggling with that a little bit because histology is very finicky with timing and coloring, but it's okay. And then um, following that, uh, like the long-term goal would be to put EGCG into a model to see how this drug performs in a genetic um, aneurysm model in an actual live mouse. And overall, we feel that if there was more research into EGCG mechanics and how it interacts with elastase itself, it would help develop a better treatment method if we can understand how those interactions actually work and what EGCG is able to do. As for us, all of our cells are dead. So those cells are not creating more elastin. They're not doing anything else, but maybe with live cells, we can see the interactions and how they might impact um, elastin fiber fragmentation and cross-linking. And yeah, that is my summer project. Hopefully you guys are able to follow along with it. Um, I would like to thank my entire lab for first of all being here and for um, supporting and providing guidance through all of this. Um, and thank you to all the program coordinators for giving us this wonderful opportunity and um, our very mentor, Sarah, thank you so much for always being around to listen and walk me through all the different complications and different problem solving moments I had to go through this summer. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful for everyone. And thank you, Aiden, for doing this project with me and going through hours and hours and hours of mechanical testing. <laughs> and yeah.
And so if you guys have any questions, I can try to answer them now. Yes. There was there was a paper that said that um, polyphenols help with collagen crosslinking. So I have I don't have didn't read that I don't like remember exactly what it did, but um, yeah. So there was a previous paper that showed that at EGCG as well as PGG, which is another polyphenol, they both help with elastin fiber dep deposition, and then a late other paper said it helped with um, collagen crosslinking. So nothing has confirmed like elastin crosslinking. So last summer, this a similar study was done with PGG, which is why we started exploring EGCG. PGG is also a polyphenol and it had very similar results. However, PG, PGG is a cytotoxic polyphenol, whereas EGCG is potentially less toxic. So kind of exploring both routes to see if we can figure out delivery methods uh, is like helpful. Okay, our next speaker is Maya Evor from Worcester Polytechnic, and she's been working in the Hitch Lab, and uh, her title is 3D Printed System for Simultaneous Stretch and Imaging of Engineered Microtissues. No. You heard the lapel. It's good. I mean, people, people in the room can definitely hear me. They're giving her a handheld mic. <laughs> also dead. <laughs> Not dead. Everyone, yeah. Oh, now I'm loud, loud. Alrighty. Okay. All right. Let's milk them. My apple. Hi everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Patricia. As she said, my name is Maya Avor. I'm a student at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts studying biomedical engineering. Um, oh, okay, good, it went away. So um, my project was creating a 3D printed system for simultaneous stretch and imaging of engineered heart tissue. So um, the focus of this is um, to do research applicable to um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as well as cardiac hypertro hypertrophy in general. So cardiac hypertrophy is a condition in which this is the unaffected heart. The affected heart um, has more muscle right in here, and that can lead to arrhythmias and heart failure. Um, this is a condition that's often diagnosed after there's already been a significant um, health issue. So it's really a problem that we're hoping to study further the effects and how this happens. So a system is needed to basically create a way to apply mechanical stress to micro tissues in order to study their response to this stress and to see if that has a, a factor in um, cardiac hypertrophy. So in this research, we created a small, easily replicable um, stretch device that is capable of um, applying small amounts of stress to uh, these micro tissues. So to do that, we first created a small chamber. In this chamber, there's four wells. They look like this here with uh, four posts in each well. So when those are seeded with uh, cell-laden collagen gel, they form these tissues as you can see here. So the way that we did that in order to prevent toxicity was through a double molding technique. So this was first printed, the chamber was first printed out of resin, SLA printed, and then it was first molded in agar, so 2.5% agar. And then once that had um, solidified, then PDMS was poured in 
So the PDMS was at a ratio of 18 to one of the base to crosslinker, and it was Silgard 184 specifically. And the reason we chose the 18 to one was based on previous research that showed that that had um, the largest amount of stretch before failure. So after that, then the PDMS chamber was created um, after curing, and then it was placed into a uh, PETG, PETG uh, stretch chamber, which was 3D printed with FDM printing. Um, next, we seeded the collagen um, gels that had fibroblasts in them. So it was NIH 3T3 fibroblasts that were used as our model. Um, so seven microliters of this cell-laden gel was seeded into each of the four wells with a density of 20 million cells per milliliter. After 24 hours, the cells, once the cells had compacted into the tissues here, stretch was applied to the chamber using um, this hex key, which turns this little screw here and pulls the end of the stretch device to the right. After that, um, you can see these are the tissues that are formed here, and the um, microscope was used to image these tissues in between each uh, stretch. So stretch happened once every 24 hours, either 10% uh, per day ratio, 20% or 30%. So some of the results that we found, we were successfully able to create a, this uniaxial stretch system capable of precise stretch. The cost for each device is less than $30. Um, the closest thing on the market is about $1,000 for each device. Um, so this is much cheaper and it's easily replicated. So we're able to make multiple of them and have multiple trials running at once. And this here is the stress distribution for the stretch chamber itself. As you can see, the stress in each of the wells is equivalent. Uh, so the final diameter of the, and I actually have one right here, it's about 60 millimeters by 40 millimeters by 10 millimeters. So it easily fits in this 100 millimeter Petri dish, um, which is helpful for cell culture application. And so with the uh, fibroblast based tissue formation, we were successfully able to stretch the tissues. Um, here on this top row, we have a stretch being applied vertically, which is perpendicular to the long axis of the tissue. And in the second photo, we also have the stretch being applied vertically which is uh, parallel to the um, long axis of the tissue. And so these two tissues here, they're um, image day two, three, four, and five, as you go from left to right. And um, as you can see, there's more compaction happening each day. So we wanted to study the effects of this stretch on the fibroblast tissues. Um, so here you can see um, one of these tissues which is stretched horizontally. Well, the image is oriented, so the stretch was applied horizontally. And so it appears as if there's compaction along that stretch axis. We also used some dye to try to image the actual cellular alignment and um, size of these tissues. So this here is with vibrant dye O stain. So it's the GFP fluorescence channel. Um, we did have some issues with uh, finding an appropriate dye um, that worked. We had uh, the first dye we tried um, didn't seem to have uh, showed up on anything. It might have been an issue even on our 2D sort of control. Um, so overall, the system allows for the study of stretch tissues, both in bright field and in fluorescence microscopy. Um, and this is really important to see what the response is of the cells themselves to the mechanical stress. So for our future work, um, continuing to study the effects of mechanical stretch on tissues, um, and hopefully that will give us a better understanding of genotype phenotype differences in cardiac conditions. Um, Future work includes refi refining the design so that the manufacture of each device is quicker. Currently, this um, little, there's this the little screw in here is soldered to the bearing so that it can spin freely while still stretching the device. 
However, that's a little bit finicky and takes a lot of precision to do. So hopefully future work can involve refining that process. Um, additionally, the current uh, limitation of the device is not actually the stretch of the chamber, um, you know, snapping the chamber, which is what was expected would be we would snap the chamber. Um, the current limitation is actually the posts will snap or bend. Uh, so looking into other materials that can be used so that we can stretch the wells more than 200% because currently the posts are snapping once the wells are um, stretched more than 200%. So just for context as well, because I don't think I mentioned it, each well is about 3.25 millimeters in diameter. So they're pretty small. Um, and... So the, the issue isn't being able to stretch the actual wells, it's being able to um, stretch them more than 200% without breaking the device, basically. Uh, ultimately, this device is very low cost. Um, it's relatively easy to manufacture and it can be produced in higher volumes. Um, so you can make multiple of these devices and have multiple trials running at once. Um, ultimately, the goal of this research is to use this device to stretch um, cardiac microtissues using cardiomyocytes, as well as um, tissues derived from induced pluripotent stem cells. So uh, I wanted to thank all of the members of the Hibsch Lab, um, some of whom are here today. So thank you for coming or coming online, um, who have been great, great mentors and have really helped me along my process. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, so yes, so there are there was a trial that we ran without any tissues in it just to control do the stress the control for the stress. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to analyze the actual displacement. There is it's visible just through microscopy. There is displacement um, that's visible just even with the naked eye, especially when you get up to one hundred and fifty or two hundred percent of the well. But in order to visualize the displacement of the posts, you do need to use the microscopy. Yes. So you mentioned one of the events. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So the just for um, sterility purposes, the uh, each chamber, which is made out of PDMS, is probably not reusable. I mean, you could reuse it um, if you cleaned it out, but you would risk breaking the actual little uh, posts that are in here made of PDMS. However. This um, chamber, the stretch device itself, is reusable as long as you don't stretch it to the point where the um, the posts are breaking. So that is definitely an advantage of once we uh, refine the material used, we will be able to reuse these. Any other questions for me? Yes. No, um, so we change the media every two to three days. Um, there hasn't been any issues with it evaporating. Um, what we do you do is we put two of these 1.5 um, milliliter tubes into the each petri dish um, filled with sterile water. Um, and that way the, there is no evaporation. Um, originally the design was a lot smaller. So instead of the um, well that hold, holds media, instead of that holding um, one mil of media, which is what it holds right now, it held about 200 microliters and there was some evaporation with that. So once the, and also the tissues didn't form because there wasn't enough media. So once it was redesigned to hold uh, one milliliter of media in there, there hasn't been any issues with evaporation. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much.
our next presenter is Calvin Paulson from the Pathak Lab. Um, he attends Clemson University. And his title is Novel 3D Ex Vivo Model for Delivering Radial Compressive Stress. Please welcome Calvin Paulson. Okay, yes. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. Um, so, like Patricia said, my name is Calvin, and I'm from Clemson University, and I'm in Dr. Puthuk's lab. And so, what I proposed to Dr. Puthuk at the beginning of the summer session was kind of looking at more dynamic forces on 3D cellular systems. So, what I've been working on this summer is creating a novel device to apply radial compression. Sorry, to apply radial compression to a suspension of cells. And so. Just as a little background as to like why that might be something of interest. Uh, in breast cancer, there's two main tissues in which uh, the cancer can develop. And so that's in the lobules and the ducts. And so specifically with ductal breast cancer, almost uh, that makes up 80% of invasive type breast cancers. So as you can see in this progressive model that has been proposed for how ductal carcinoma progresses, you can see that you have this nice open lumen in the breast duct tissue. And then you get uh, some kind of initial cellular atypia, like some beginnings of uh, cancer. And what they do is they, uh, they invade the duct. And so eventually they completely fill the lumen of the, ves uh, of the, uh, of the duct. And so what this means is that you can get growth-induced solid stresses that develop. And so these solid stresses cause the collapse of vessels at the interior of the, the dense tumor. And so that means that you can have hypoxia that develops, or you can also have like low pH type systems. And we know that those things kind of lead to more aggressive type phenotypes in breast cancer. But less understood is the actual effect of the radial compression on the cells. So what we wanted to investigate was the actual phenotypical difference that might develop on these cells from radial compression. So kind of going beyond just looking at the pH and the hypoxia that might develop in this microenvironment and looking at and seeing what effect the compression has. And so kind of how we went about this was multiple prototypes were designed to try to create a novel system. And what we ended up doing was we ended up using um, just kind of similar to Maya, a PDMS elastomer has very good mechanical properties, just at a one to 10 weight percent ratio, which is just the common industry standard that is typically used. And like Maya, we were also using Siligard 184, uh, which just uses a platinum based catalyst instead of 10. Uh, and so, to fabricate this, we just did a once over type mold. So we just had a negative of the wells. And so what we used was to just keep costs down, we used 3D printing. So just a fused deposition modeling printer, specifically like the Luz bolt that's just in the makerspace. And so we printed it out of TPU, uh, TPU 95A, which is just thermoplastic, um, thermoplastic ure, uh, urethane 95A. And so that's actually a very flexible polymer. And so the idea kind of comes from if you have like a, like a silicone baking sheet, for example, it's nice and flexible. It allows you to pop out delicate geometries that might otherwise be difficult. So it's the same principle because the wells are kind of a delicate geometry. We wanted to have a way to kind of easily remove the mold. Um, and so one thing that we found though, was that TPU95 kind of inhibits that platinum crosslinker that I was mentioning in the PDMS. So we did have to use this silicone modified conformal coating on the mold just to make sure that the PDMS was fully cured. And so when the PDMS is cured, we cured it at 65 degrees C for around two hours. Sometimes we needed to do longer if it was necessary. Um, so that was forming the plate. So then after we form the plate, we have to create our suspension of cells, right? And so because this is a 3D system, what we're interested in is we're interested in creating basically a small little cluster of cells that are going to be suspended in a matrix. And the matrix is made out of collagen. And so here in this picture here, you can see what is called an ultra low adhesion plate. And so what we did was we seeded 1.5K of MCF10As, which are just fibro, uh, fibrotic breast tissue. So we're not currently looking at uh, breast cancer cells yet. And so we seeded those into the ULA plates and we waited overnight for the spheroids to form. 
Uh, and then we also fixed our PDMS wells to our, uh, currently I would want to use like a one well type cell culture plate, but currently we're using the top of a set, like a 12 well culture plate just for ease for right now. And that's just oxygen, oxygen plasma treated to fixate the PDMS to the lid. And so the next steps are then cleaning the PDMS. So it goes through UV crosslinker and PBS washers just to kind of smooth in and clean out the PDMS. And after the PDMS is cleaned, it's then uh, prepped for creating the actual 3D system. So what we do is kind of like a sandwiching method. So you can kind of see it here, but in this well, we have an initial layer of collagen that gets deposited down and that's allowed to polymerize. Then we add in our spheroidive cells as well as the top layer of collagen. So it gets sandwiched and it creates a nice 3D system where the spheroid is suspended. And then we just add the media. And for right now, we're just using a radial strap to apply the compression, but I'll mention this in future work, how we can create a more dynamic system. And then imaging, imaging is currently ongoing. So just improving the imageability of the PDMS is definitely something that we're still working on. But the idea is just, we're gonna look at uncompressed compressed system to see if there's a phenotypical difference between the cells. Uh, and then for results, this is kind of like all the, uh, all the, different things I had to do to currently get the model to where it is. So in this first one, this is just like a mold release study that I did where I was using different types of filaments for the mold itself, for the negative, as well as different treatments. And so, like I mentioned before, the piece that we found was using a flexible TPUA 95 filament with a conformal coating over the top worked the best for generating the flexible wells. Here you can see, we ran some experiments to figure out what cell seeding density we needed as well as volume for generating our spheroids. Uh, and so again, we ended up finding that 1.5 K cells in a 20 microliter volume was the best for these uh, ULA plates that we're using from Effendorf with this cell type. And then at the bottom for the imaging, um, here you can see kind of like a completed version where it's like fixed to the top of the well plate. You have the PDMS and you have the compressed system and the uncompressed system. And so we would just put this in a 24 hour time-lapse study where we look at, and so, sorry, I forgot to mention, but these are nuclear modified uh, GFP MCF 10A. So we would also be looking at uh, some fluorescence in addition to bright field. But then in terms of conclusions, why this model could be of interest to uh, mechanical studies of cells is that this model allows for kind of bulk setting type cell culture. So it's very traditional cell culturing techniques, uh, as well as it's applying some radial compression to the suspension of cells. Cause there are commercial aspects of like tensile type systems that allow for stretch testing, but there's not really anything out there that's dealing with compression, like this type of radial compression. Like there's piston, piston actuator type systems where it's like this uniaxial pressing. Um, but this system seeks to apply a radial compression. And then in terms of like future work, so here, what we're thinking of doing is basically using, uh, like when you go to the doctor's office, the idea came from like the blood pressure cuff essentially. So this thing's your manometer. So the idea is around the well, you have these inflatable uh, donuts and they compress the well walls to apply the radial compression to the suspension of cells. That way we can create a more dynamic system versus just a radial strap. So in this way, we can kind of more control how much compression we apply as well as uh, the, uh, um, we can vary the amount, the amounts. And so in terms of what we can look at, right, we can look at ECM deposition and cross-linking, we can look at the fiber alignment. Uh, and so we can also look at row rock signaling, actin, myosin stainings, just to see what's kind of going on in the microenvironment. And so what we believe is that these experiments will help to offer more insight to how the compression itself is affecting the phenotype of the cells. Um, but yeah, and then just acknowledgement. So I'd like to thank everyone in the POFAC lab they were all very, very welcoming. Um, so it was great getting to work with everyone. Um, it was definitely really interesting getting to propose my own project. Like that for me, the freedom to kind of explore and of course fail uh, sometimes a lot uh, was definitely really good to learn from. So I really enjoyed my experience. And then of course, I'd like to thank Gwen and Patricia um, for helping coordinate the program. Um, and then of course, all my all the people in my cohort uh, in the CMB, but yeah.
Any questions? So one thing that we would expect to see is probably faster migrations into the surrounding matrix. So we would probably see a more aggressive type of invasion into the surrounding matrix is what we would look at. So we would just be simply like the, the information we'd be collecting is simply like looking at the uh, morphological like look of the cells as well as like their behavior in the matrix. So that would be what we would probably expect. Okay, yeah. All right, welcome back to our second half of our presentations today. Our next speaker will be Daichi Kobayashi from the Boston Lab. His title is Effects of Magnetic Field Induced Alignment on Cellulose Nanocrystal and Soy Protein Nanocomposite Mechanical Properties. Here's Daichi Kobayashi. Hello, I'm Daichi. Oh, wait, it's not... Yeah, and it's just okay. off. All right. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Hello, I'm Daiichi. I'm in the Boston lab. Um, my work this summer has been on cellulose, nanocrystal, and soy protein isolate nanocomposites, as the title suggests. And um, I guess as an overall uh, overview, um, protein films show some potential as alternatives to plastic films. Uh, the problem is, though, uh, like many other biological-based uh, uh, materials, like those paper Starbucks straws that fall apart in your mouth, uh, they tend to be uh, weaker and inferior in terms of their mechanical properties and barrier properties um, compared to the conventional plastic versions. However, um, for these protein films, if you incorporate cellulose nanocrystals into uh, their matrices, you, and you uh, see enhanced mechanical properties, enhanced uh, strength, stiffness, and uh, enhanced uh, impermeability to water, uh, enhanced water resistance. And the best thing about these cellulose nanocrystals is that uh, they're just from plants, right? They're another plant-based material. Um, they come from the cell walls of plants. Uh, when you, uh, specifically, when you hydrolyze the amorphous regions of plant cellulose, leaving behind only the crystalline regions. And so these cellulose nanocrystals, they're on the order of strength and stiffness of Kevlar and, st and steel. So you can imagine, it's kind of like putting, if you were able to mix steel and rubber, um, you have, uh, if you were able to make it homogenous, you would find something that is uh, in between the properties of those two items. And so that's kind of what a nanocomposite is in this sense. You have the weaker protein matrix and you have the stronger cellulose nanocrystal uh, filler. And that effect leads to an overall reinforcement of the material. Now, cellulose nanocrystals have a little bit of a trick to them. Um, they have something that's called a negative diamagnetic anisotropy, which essentially means that when they are in suspension um, in the presence of a strong mag magnetic field, the rods will align um, because they are rod-like shape. Um, they will align perpendicular to that applied magnetic field. Now, what this means is that on top of um, the already enhanced barrier properties, these cellulose nanocrystals, when they are aligned, they will further, uh, they will further improve these uh, barrier properties, meaning that uh, gas will have a harder time passing through them. They will also, as a side effect of this alignment, uh, induce anisotropic mechanical properties in the nanocomposite matrix, which essentially means that um, it can uh, has one uh, mechanical directions in one direction will be, or mechanical uh, strength and stiffness in one direction will be stronger than in another direction. And so you can imagine that as a lot of tissue, uh, human, animal, um, biological tissue is anisotropic, this would allow um, us to uh, use these nanocomposite films that are aligned 
in tissue engineering applications, such as scaffolds that allow um, cells, uh, that cells can grow off of, or um, even in food packaging with enhanced barrier properties that also um, would have, uh, that's also another application of these nanocomposites. And so that is what I am working on, or what I have worked on this summer, um, aligning the cellulose nanocrystals in a soy protein isolate matrix and creating um, nanocomposite films uh, that have anisotropic properties. And so uh, I wanted to test, um, first of all, can we align these cellulose nanocrystals? Um, how do we uh, verify that they are aligned and how does it affect the mechanical properties of the resulting nanocomposite film? And so uh, the first step of this process is to isolate the cellulose nanocrystals. So um, let's see if I can maybe zoom in on my diagram. So uh, first step, as I said, was isolating cellulose nanocrystals. So we uh, treated paper pulp with sulfuric acid that was hot, and that ended up hydrolyzing the amorphous regions of the cellulose that was in the paper pulp, as paper pulp is uh, rich in cellulose. And so the hydrolysis um, results in the isolation of these nanocrystals. And we wanted to verify that we had the right product, that we had something that would work in a nanocomposite and that would itself align. So the infrared spectrum of our uh, supposed cellulose nanocrystal product uh, very closely matches the feedstock pulp, which indicates one that it is indeed cellulose. So we know that since it is cellulose, then uh, it will have that same negative diamagnetic anisotropy that will allow it to align in a magnetic field. Uh, next up, we analyze the zeta potential range uh, via dynamic light scattering um, the zeta potential range uh, range from around negative 42 to around negative 20 millivolts, um, indicating that um, cellulose nanocrystals had a deposition of sulfate groups on their surfaces as a result of the sulfuric acid treatment. Um, this means that because of the negative charge on the cellulose nanocrystals, um, they will have a good dispersibility in a suspension which is essential for a nanocomposite as we would want it to have a more or less homogeneous distribution of these cellulose nanocrystals. Next up, we have some images of these cellulose nanocrystals. We have atomic force microscopy micrographs or microscopic images um, that show that cellulose nanocrystals conform to our expectations of what um, they would look like. Uh, they, they are a rod-like shape, very high aspect ratio, um, around 200 nanometers in this example, they tend to range from around 100 to 700 nanometers, um, just our samples, and that is uh, consistent with literature. So what this means is that one will have the nanoscale filler effect, so it'll be um, small enough to be able to be distributed homogeneously and also reinforce the matrix well. But on top of that, um, so because they are a rod-like shape, then they will have differing effects when they align in a nanocomposite as opposed to something that is like spherical. And so we verified that the cellulose nanocrystals are of the right properties. And now we uh, move on to the actual nanocomposite um, development. So what we did was we combined these cellulose nanocrystals with soy protein glycerol water, which is the bulk composite. And um, we mixed them all together. And eventually we would just pour out our, um, our material in these uh, not necessarily petri dishes, but in some molds. And so we would just let them, uh, what, we would let the uh, nanocomposites dry in these molds. And here's an example, an image of the mold right over here. Um, so we would let the nanocomposites dry in the mold, um, just like through air evaporation uh, of the water. And what we are left with is ultimately a dry nanocomposite film. Now, during the drying, some of the treatment is uh, the magnetic field treatment. So we use the 12 Tesla MRI, um, for uh, the drying, uh, or dr we set the films to dry in a 12 Tesla MRI as our experimental group. And so what we would expect from this is the alignment of the nanocrystals. Initially, they are in an isotropic configuration, but the, um, the uh, magnetic field exposure would cause them to align perpendicularly to that magnetic field. And this is another diagram depicting it. So for a film that is uh, set parallel, to the magnetic field, we would expect the nanocomposite, uh, the uh, nanocrystals to align perpendicular to that magnetic field. Um, so they are stretching along the uh, axial um, equatorial plane. 
And for the um, film that is cast perpendicular to the magnetic field, um, we would expect that the nanocrystals would be aligned in such a way that they um, are kind of parallel to the main, the long axis of the film. And um, so our first, uh, or at least the first step here is to image the nanocomposites um, after fracturing them. And so if we were to cross section them across this equatorial plane, um, at least for the, um, for the parallel uh, film processing case, we would see, um, at least what we would expect to see is the um, is longer uh, nano rods, uh, the, the, the rod like shape, it would be a side on view of the nanocrystals um, if we were to uh, look at it from the cross-sectional uh, direction. Um, and for the other case, which is the film that is cast uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field, it's almost difficult to see on this screen, but um, we would be seeing a head-on view of the nanocrystals. So it would be less visible um, and may perhaps less plentiful, uh, less noticeable and a lot smaller. So how does this actually uh, work in practice, we um, took scanning electron microscopy images of the films, depending uh, or fracturing them across the equatorial plane and uh, trying to see um, if we in fact did achieve um, this desired alignment configuration. Um, you can see that there are some differences in these micrographs between the uh, parallel and the perpendicular configuration. Case A corresponds with uh, this uh, parallel configuration, in case B corresponds with the perpendicular configuration. Um, and so they are a lot more noticeable, it seems, in this left image compared to the right image. Um, the rod shape is perhaps more plentiful, but um, no decisive, uh, no conclusive statements can uh, be made without any uh, uh, quantitative image analyses. And so this is what we will need to work on in the future. But these results uh, show promise in SEM for determining alignment uh, in future work. Next up is the mechanical testing. So what we would do, or what we did, was we ended up stretching the nanocomposite films in the long direction. So you have these little like clips uh, would clip onto the, um, the larger areas and then it would be stretched and until it fractured. And so the ultimate tensile strength is the, uh, is the maximum uh, force over the cross-sectional area of the films that was endured. And so um, this data, this graph of ultimate tensile strength um, versus CNC concentration and uh, with aligned parallel versus perpendicular uh, cases tells us multiple things. One, um, as we would expect for a nanocomposite, increasing concentration of cellulose nanocrystals does in fact lead to an, a trend of increasing uh, ultimate tensile strength. Um, the difference is significant between 0% and 10%. Um, though it is not significant between 0, 1, and 5%. And this may do, be due to variability within each of the uh, test groups um, because we do have large standard deviations. Um, so we know that this has uh, the nanocomposite properties, um, the reinforcing properties of uh, cellulose nanocrystals. And now we move on to the aligned parallel and perpendicular cases. So for the 1% uh, cellulose nanocrystal concentration case, we can clearly see that there is a significant difference in the strength between the parallel and the perpendicular aligned cases. Now, as a refresher, going back to that previous diagram of the aligned parallel and perpendicular cases, um, we see that uh, the parallel case would have the cellulose nanocrystals kind of aligned with the equatorial plane of the film. Um, this would, at least when you were, uh, if you were to mechanically test that, it would, um, the cellulose nanocrystals wouldn't really be able to distribute the strength uh, as well as they would if they were aligned um, with the long axis of the film. Because if they were aligned with the long axis of the film, they would be able to distribute the stress that is applied to them a lot more easily. And that is what we see in the ultimate tensile strength, uh, strength ten trends. The strength does increase from... Um, parallel to the perpendicular cases, it is significant in 1% and the mean is different in the 5% case, though more data collection would be needed to ensure that we do get significant data. And similarly for the Young's modulus, which is another measure of stiffness, um, the, uh, there is a trend of increasing um, just with the unaligned nanocomposites that we would expect with the cellulose nanocrystal uh, addition. Um, that is significant between the 0% and the 10% case. Um, there's also a trend of increasing Young's modulus between the parallel and the perpendicular cases, um, though it is not significant. Um, but the overall trend of this data 
the increase between parallel and perpendicular, at least in the means, uh, suggests to us that alignment was successfully um, uh, achieved. And um, this shows us that um, we are able to use magnetic fields to align the cellulose nanocrystals in a nanocomposite and the alignment will be maintained in the dry nanocomposite. This affects, this induces, as we can see, this apparent uh, mechanical anisotropy. So this shows promise for future studies. Um, we would want to, okay. So we would want to um, further test these properties. One, um, we want to ensure that our data is statistically significant, um, or at least that the data the the data is um, has as low error as possible. So more studies are needed. We might need to change our processing methods to reduce this variability within groups and between batches. Um, we'll need to uh, analyze if we were to um, focus on an application, for example, in food packaging, um, because due to this uh, anisotropy and in, in mechanical properties. Um, we, since the nanocrystals are aligned, then uh, that means supposedly, out, uh, based on the theory at least, the nanocrystals would also result in increasing uh, barrier properties as well. And so um, that would be the next step to test the barrier properties of these nanocomposites. Will aligning the cellulose nanocrystals in this matrix result in increased uh, impermeability to water vapor. Water vapor will have, will it have a harder time passing through it? Um, that is what we want to test. And also the contact angle of uh, a water droplet. We also would like to test this to determine the hydrophobicity, how it changes between the unaligned and the aligned cases. And um, if this technology were to uh, be successful, if there were to be significant differences in the water vapor property, and if the mechanical um, properties are still um, strong and comparable with a uh, with something that is on the market already, then this uh, the science and the um, I guess the processing behind these films could perhaps make its way into the market um, into something that could be the next uh, what's it called saran wrap that could be the next saran wrap, and so it's pretty exciting. So I'd like to acknowledge the Faustin Lab. Um, big thanks, especially to um, Dr. Faustin and Jerry um, for all his help and mentorship. Uh, thank you to the uh, Center for Engineering Mechanobiology um, for the funding and for the support for making this project possible. And a big thanks to Dr. Uh, James Quirk who allowed us to use his MRI facility to dry our films. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? A smile. So we can align the 10%, but the problem is um, the processing of films, um, once we get to 10% is a lot more difficult and there's much higher losses of the films because we have to cut them out from the molds. And so the 10% films tend to be, um, they, they may experience some CNC agglomerations that we will have to address. Um, so that causes uh, more losses in films. So we decided it would be best to test the 1% and the 5% cases, just so then we would have the maximum number of films to test. Right. Um, so when you're aligning them in the MRI. Yeah, so um, the films themselves do not have magnetic properties, but the cellulose nanocrystals, um, they do have this like a uh, diamagnetic anisotropy. So it's a function of the bond dipoles, the individual bond dipoles and the rod like shape, which allows it to um, end up aligning perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, perhaps there is a, there, there could potentially be a small effect of the soy protein itself uh, having some diamagnetic properties um, due to also like it being having polar dipoles, though um, we have not probed this, um, but we would we expect it to be negligible compared to the cellulose nanocrystals. Yes, so um, cellulose nanocrystals tend to align um, in under strong, mag uh, strong magnetic fields. Um, so in order to achieve the maximum alignment uh, parameter, um, we would want to use the strongest possible magnetic field um, as opposed to like something that's like maybe like a three Tesla. Three Tesla could achieve alignment, 
um, but it wouldn't, it may not be as obvious or may not lead to as significant differences compared to a 12 Tesla. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Alexandra Perez. She's been in the Zenon lab this summer, and her uh, title is Flow Fields and Connector Based Vascular and Anastomosis. Please welcome Alexandra. Can you guys hear me? Okay, perfect. Oh, good morning. My name is Alexandra Perez Lopez, and I'm a chemical engineering undergraduate student at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez. This summer, I had the opportunity to be working at Dr. Gannon's lab, in which I worked with this very interesting project about how vas connector based vascular anastomosis affects blood flow fields. So, what is vascular anastomosis? Vascular anastomosis is a surgical technique that is critical in a lot of surgical interventions, such as coronary artery bypass, organ transplants, and vascular. and vascular reconstruction. So, it is performed in the presence of two severe or broken vasculars. It consists of suturing or joining these two vasculars together with the purpose of restoring blood flow. Um, this technique is very precise, it's time consuming, and it's not cost effective because of the preciseness it requires to connect the tunica intima of the two severe blood vessels together. So in an attempt to make this procedure easier, more feasible, less time consuming, and more time cost effective, a sutureless and ostomotic device was proposed, which is a connector-based structure. So this structure will be inserted in the tunica intima of the blood vessels, which is the inner layer of the blood vessels. And this would hold the two blood vessels together to ensure um, rapid and effective recovery. The problem with having this connector in the vasculature is that it creates a perturbation in the blood flow. And that perturbation in the blood flow can lead to increasing or decreasing blood flow shear rates, which can, which can promote thrombus formation. So the goal of this research is to study which components of the blood flow affect this characteristics and how we can ease and alleviate the pr probability of forming thromb thrombus. So how do we approach this? So we perform numerical simulations and analysis of how the, disconnect the presence of the connector in the blood vessel is going to look like and how will that create a distension. So the blood vessels were simulated as cylindrical linear elastic tubes with isotropic and incompressible prop material properties. The blood rheology was approximated using the non-Newtonian blood um, bird Corot model, which accounts for the shear thinning and viscoelastic properties of the blood. The inlet of the 
the inlet boundary condition of the vessel was modeled with center line velocity function, and the outlet boundary condition of the blood vessel was simulated and modeled using the wind castle, the two element wind castle model, which accounts for peripheral resistance and blood's inertia. After creating this model, we ran the simulations and a parameter sweep of the radial distension and the thickness of the connector was performed. So, um, and the top part, where is the point? This plot right, right here shows the peak center line velocity as a function of time for two cardiac cycles. So this is the first cardiac cycle and this is the second cardiac cycle. So in this shear rate plot, we can appreciate how the thickness of the connector is going to affect the shear rate. So here we have a thickness of 0 0.25 millimeters, which shows a high shear rate. We have the presence of 0 0.50 millimeters and 0 0.75 millimeters. So as the thicker the connector is, the higher the shear rate that the blood flow is going to show. To alleviate this high shear rates, we a parameter sweep of the radial distension of the blood vessel was performed. So here we have the plots showing the shear rate distribution for the radial distension. This is a 0 0.05 radial distension, which showed a high shear rate. We have a 0 0.1 radial distension, which reduced the flow shear rate. And we have a 0 0.15 millimeters radial distension, which increased the shear rate significantly. What this showed is that increasing the radial distension up to a limit in which the outer diameter of the blood vessel lines with the inner diameter of the connector is the optimal radial distension for the, for the vessel. We can also appreciate, if you look very closely, um, how the, there's the high concentration of shear rate at the edges of the connector right here, and low concentrations of flow shear rate at the areas in which the wall connects with the connector that can allow for flow recirculation or flow stagnation, which can promote thrombosis. Um, the probability of thrombus formation was modeled with models that account for the time and spatial area of exposure of the blood to pathological shear rates that are above 1200 or below 50. The 1200 limit was approximated with the maximum shear rate that the vessel without the connector will resist. So here we can see the volume of the blood that will show a minimum flow shear rate of below 50. And here we can appreciate a, a plot of the volume of the blood that will show a shear rate of above 1200. Here we can appreciate how the distension of the vessel is going to alleviate the shear rate as a function of time. So um, for all the parameters that were studied, uh, it was shown that the thickness of the connector had a direct impact on the flow shear rate. Also that the distension of the vessel was very beneficial for the blood flow shear rate up to an extent in which it does not pass the outer diameter of the blood vessel. It was also shown that at the outlet of the vessel, um, there was flow stagnation and low shear rates, but it did, did not show high pathological shear rates. Increasing the thickness of the connector increased the pathological shear rates. Um, this research is important because it helps us describe and understand better the blood rheology and how having this connector in the presence of the blood flow is going to affect. This will also help the development of new anastomotic procedures to help surgeons develop more efficient and even more beneficial for the patients too. So, thank you. Oh, so the models were created with Comsol Multiphysics, which is a computational fluid dynamics software. And the post-processing was performed using MATLAB and the coding was also used with MATLAB.
Yeah, actually, this project is based with the plastic surgery department at the Mid Campus. Um, they are working with the more medical aspect of the research, and I was studying how beneficial it would be this radial distension, but that should is going to be tested in well, aspects. So. Our next presenter is Natalia Leo de Respeto uh, from the Suleiman Lab, and her title is Unraveling the Role of Hormones in Protocyte Dynamics and Function. Please welcome Natalia. Oh. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Natalia Yudere Trepo. I am a rising sophomore in the University of Puerto Rico in Calle, where I'm majoring in biology. This summer, I had the amazing opportunity of working in Hani Suleiman's lab in the MAD campus, where they focus on the study of kidneys and different pathologies that affect it. And I am very thrilled to be here today presenting to you my research findings on kidney function. First, I want to give you a little background about how kidney work. Um, Sorry, thank you. Okay, so here is a picture of a cut section of the kidney. In the renal cortex of the kidney is localized the nephrons. Nephrons are the basic um, functional units of the kidney where there are the glomerulus and tubules. Uh, the glomerulus is a small ball filled with capillaries that is in charge of the filtration of waste products in the blood with the help of podocytes. Today, I want to talk to you mostly about what podocytes are. Here's a basic diagram of how a podocyte looks like. It's like a little octopi that attaches to the glomeruli basement membrane of the glomerulus. And along with the food processes, they form these filtration slits, which are very tiny spaces to prevent large molecules such as proteins escape to the urine and cause proteinuria and uncomfortable problems. So it has been recently found that podocytes, like dysfunction in podocytes, leads to kidney disease and different types of problems. And these podocytes have recently found to develop sarcomere-like structures in response to their injury. This injury could be to, 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 due to a lot of factors such as aging, genetic mutations, and even immune mechanisms. So um, here I want to explain a little bit about what is a sarcomere. Sarcomere is the basic contractile unit of the muscle cells and they're located in the cardiac muscle and the skeletal muscle. Base, um, they are composed of sea lines and perpendicular to them. They're thin filaments composed of actin and thick filaments composed of myosin and they're in charge of the contractile and realization mechanisms of the cell. So, a research study has found here in this model that the podocytes have like similar structures to these. And in the left, you can see a normal podocyte, and in the right side, you can see an injured podocyte. Um, it is 
you can see in the paper a little bit more closely that in a normal podocyte, there are only actin cables extending to the fruit processes. However, in an interpodocyte, there is, there is a total effacement of the actin cables and the myosin cables that are usually on the cell body. And now they form these sarcomere-like structures in the like along with the glomerular basement membrane. So it has also been found that formins are likely responsible for the elongation and rearrangements of the sarcomere-like structures. And particularly, IDF2 is widely expressed in this kidney podocytes and tubules. Um, there are a total of 14 mammalian formins in our body, and four of these mutate in the kidney. And what happens with these mutations is that it can also lead to kidney dysfunction. So it is suggested that the formins like the INF2 formin are involved in maintaining the dynamic structure and stability of both podocyte food processes and their filtration slits. So this is why I wanted to aim to unravel the role of such formants in the podocyte dynamics and function. A little overview of the methods that I did was working with primary podocytes and podocytes like differentiated podocyte cell lines, which are cell lines that acquire the, char the characteristics of a podocyte um, for um, fluorescence staining and imaging. And we also use siRNA for the inhibition of formants. So to talk a little bit of more about my results, in the first result here, there is an overview of what a, like a normal glomerula looks like and how an injured one looks like right here. And we noticed that there is a higher presence of the formant in this glomerula here. So to, to tell you about the savings, firstly, Sitnatopodin is a marker for the um, acting cytoskeleton of the podocytes, how you look, like how it looks right here. The INF2 formin is on blue. And then the nitrogen, which is a marker for the glomerular basement membrane, is marked on red. So we wanted to have a closer look about the localization of the INF2 formin. So we used the iris scan microscope to um, observe the sitnaptopodin and the INF2 foramen, which in this case is in red. And we notice that there is a location in the periphery of these food processes, around the food processes. After that, we decided to knock down two formins, both um, MDL1 and INF2, to observe what would happen to the sarcomere-like structures and to affirm that, like, what was the role the formants in the development of sarcomeres, where we found, where, when comparing the pictures, then both in a normal um, podocyte cell line and, like, a differentiated podocyte cell line, sorry, and a knockdown podocyte cell line, there was still presence of the sarcomere-like structures where you can see a little bit better in the pictures. Um, and that's where we, like, we found that probably they are not strictly, like the formants are not strictly required for the development of these sarcomere-like structures as they still formed uh, without the presence of the formants. Um, we also wanted to look at, um, to look into the bright field mode of the microscope to observe the cell attachment. And interestingly, interestingly enough, we found that in the control, there was a normal spreading of the cells. However, when we knocked down the MDL1 and the INF2, we noticed that about a day later, the cells, like, they started to spread, but a day later, this they started to round up and detach from the surface, which suggests a potential role in the cell attachment. So in this result right here, we wanted to stain for the INF2 formin and cortactin, as we now know that there's a potential role in cell attachment. So cortactin is a marker of, for the cell periphery. So it was going to give you give us a little bit of an idea of how this spreading of the cell worked. 
Um, this was also in differentiated podocyte cell lines. And it is like we observed that there is a higher signal of the INF2 formin wherever there was presence of cortactin, which suggests uh, further a role in the cell motility and maybe in the early formation of the sarcomere like structures, which you can see in both of the pictures. Um, after like after having an idea of the localization of the INF2 formin in, in differentiated podocyte cell lines, we wanted to reaffirm that what we were observing was accurate. So we stained for synaptopotent and INF2 on primary podocytes, which were um, directly extract extracted from kidney tissue. And we also like it was accurate that the INF2 formin also localizes in the periphery of the cell and we also had the chance to observe the sarcomere-like structures around like in the cytoskeleton of the cell. We then decided like we wanted to know what would happen if we inhibited the cell with blebistatin, which is basically an inhib like a contractile inhibitor of like non-muscle cells which contain myosin and we found that the development of the sarcomere structures were heavily interrupted along with the localization of the INF2 formin. You can no longer see that the INF2 formin is localizing in the periphery of the cell, like for like maybe spreading. So it was very interesting because in summary, we found that even though the INF2 formin is not required for the development of these sarcomere-like structures, there is a crucial role in them in both like cell motility and maybe the early stage of sarcomere-like structures along with their cell attachment. So their potential role, a future study would like dig deeper about like they could work with gene therapy, with myomaterials design and tissue engineering to take a closer look about what we're seeing is really accurate and then to decipher which of the um, four mints work together in that like, specific cell attachment factor. So yeah, I wanna really thank my bench mentor, Shuman, which like he was the best mentor I could ever had. I want to also thank Hani Suleiman's lab. And I want to take all of like all of the program. Thank you so much. If you have any questions. No questions? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalia, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Uh, this concludes the presentation part. We do have some gifts for our students and for the bench mentors and the Bayer mentors and PIs. Um, if you would, uh, everyone, come up forward. We have um, we have some CEMB mugs and. Venus flytraps. The reason we have Venus flytraps for our people is because we feel that it represents mechanobiology um, in the most direct sense. You know, it's a uh, cross kingdom uh, as mechanobiology is. You know, the movement of plants and the movement of animals can be um, be bridged by the Venus flytrap. And so we have those as sort of our, our mascot and we have those for each of of our participants. And thank you so much. Uh, we will conclude. I probably should already turned off the recording. If not, we will do that soon. Um, and do join us for lunch. Thank you. Uh -huh.